It has been one year since U.S. President Barack Obama announced his climate action plan. It is part of an effort to prepare U.S. companies and citizens for the impact of climate change. Let's take a look at some of the plan's targets. Reducing carbon pollution from power plants, check. Increasing fuel economy of cars and light trucks, check. Preparing the U.S. for the impacts of climate change, Partial check there. Washington did make progress on this with a series of reports and streams of funding, but it has not included the insurance and health sectors of the economy. Leading international efforts to address global climate change. Climate change. No check there. The U.S. has not expanded clean energy like nuclear or clean coal or cut energy waste, but it has formed a new climate working group with India, and last year the U.S. and China agreed to phase out certain types of pollutants. Well, a new report called the Risky Business Project highlights the consequences of climate inaction to the U.S. business community. For more details, I spoke with Henry Paulson. He's a former U.S. Treasury Secretary and chairman of the Paulson Institute at the University of Chicago. I began by talking about projections with him for far more days of heat above 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. If you look at temperatures, uh, you know, looking in, for instance, the southeast part of the United States. Over the last 40 years, there's been maybe an average of, of eight days with a temperature of 95 degrees or more. Looking to mid-century now, uh, we're looking at maybe two months of, uh, of, of days over 95 degrees. You know, those are, some days, it's, it's just, it's hard to survive without air conditioning. And that's going to have a b big impact. Uh, and, of course, you combine that with the sea level rise, you just see really uh, significant impacts. If you look at regions and you look at industry sectors, you know, I, I grew up on a farm in Illinois. And uh, if you look at agriculture overall, there's an impact, but it's, it's smoothed out by the averages. You're looking at... Uh, at uh, Productions going down on average, you know, the next five to 25 years, 10 percent. But you go out further, you know, you're, they're going down 50, 80 percent in a, in a number of situations. But again, I want to come back to something that is, I, I think, even more significant, and that is the, you know, protecting ourselves against these, you know, maybe lower probability. Uh, really high impact uh, risks, these outsized risks. Sort and, of one in a hundred uh, chance. Uh, well, yeah, there's one in a hundred, one in twenty, one in one in ten. But I think the important part about this study is that it gives us a methodology that is used to help understand these risks. Mm -hmm. And I don't have great confidence in the ability to predict. As a matter of fact, I think things could be significantly worse. So you they, say to the business community, be prepared yeah. for the worst case scenario? Oh, 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 absolutely. You, you don't just look at the most likely case. You need to look at the worst case. That's why you, that's why you take out it, in, insurance. And again... And this is sort of a rallying cry, if you will, to get that type of insurance, oh, oh, right? It, it absolutely is. I believe it was in your op-ed. You said 40 percent of companies listed on the S&P 500 don't disclose climate risks. But to the extent that these companies are not disclosing climate risks, are American companies prepared for climate change? Well, you are hitting on a major issue because this is aimed at American companies. And let me say, I think American companies are as prepared as any companies around the world. So let's just not, I think American companies are leaders in many ways and in many ways are ahead of the government. But uh, no, American companies aren't adequately prepared. And I think there are a number of things that I that are very important. Yeah, what should they do okay. if they're watching right so, now? So I'd give you give you three things to do if you're watching right now. First of all, when you're making long-term investments, make them with climate change in mind, in terms of where you locate the plants and in terms of the types of technologies you choose, because you don't want stranded, outmoded assets. No one could afford that. Secondly, I'd say to investors demand that companies make disclosures. To the SEC, require that companies make disclosures. Mm. What kinds of disclosures? Disclose the, their, their carbon emissions, and because that is a potentially significant liability. Uh, disclose 
you know, enough information about assets so you can, so the investors can, can understand which assets may become stranded or outmoded in, in, in a new world. And then thirdly, which I think is very important, I think businesses which are leading in so many other areas should lead and make it easier for, uh, encourage the government to, to develop a policy, a way of putting a price on carbon or other policies to deal with this. Because the important point that I have not made yet out of this study is that we've got these big outsized risks and they can be avoided. They can be prevented if we act immediately. Now, while the report's authors did not offer solutions to this climate crisis, Paulson himself has advocated for a carbon tax. A number of countries around the world have already put a levy on carbon emissions, including Australia, the UK, and Finland. I asked Paulson how he can convince skeptical business owners that this idea won't increase their costs. It's a fee that those who emit carbon pay. And it's, if you want to change behavior, it's the most efficient way to change behavior and to create incentives to develop new clean technologies. Now, what, what, what I would say is a healthy environment is you know, very consistent with a healthy economy. People keep saying to me, you're a Republican, look at all the Republicans that disagree. I'm proud to be a Republican. I know dozens of Republicans that are business leaders, political leaders that are ready for and welcome a fact-based, science-based discussion mm -hmm. of, uh, of climate change. Doing that in the United States will make a difference. Now, there's nothing the United States can do by itself, because when you look at the, you know, you know, the developing nations, right. and you look at the, the, the emissions in China and India and so on, this, this can't be done by the U.S. alone. As a matter of fact, most of the work has got to be done in, in, in China, but if we don't lead, it's going to be harder to, 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 to work with them to solve some of these problems. Let me quickly get to the work you're doing at the Paulson Institute to that effort. You want to be a bridge, essentially, between the United States and China on these issues. Yeah. What are you working on right now that would help move the ball down the field, if you will? Well, we, we have a variety of programs. We have pr programs that are focused on urban sustainability, because the next 300 million people going to the cities in China are going to drive environmental outcomes in China and globally in addition to economic outcomes. So we have, we, we have an awards program for, uh, which we call Cities of the, you know, the Future. So what- and This what, is a what, global award? It, it is an award for, for you know, a project in China, an urbanization project that's, that can be rolled out in scale and make right. a very big difference. We have mayor's training programs. We have, so we have a variety of things and we're, uh, we, we are, uh, doing a number of things in the conservation area, and uh, we're exploring a number of initiatives very seriously where we're uh, helping out and would help out with in terms of the air quality issue.